I'm Paul Moffat. I'm Jan Moffat. And this is Clockworks, a Legion podcast. Welcome to the second episode of season two. Because the second <laughs> episode of the second season. Tick, tick, tick. Because get it like the second hand <laughs> I, in yeah, a clock. No, no, it's enough. Because it's, we're called I Clockworks. Get it. I get it. So, I get it. All right. Well, we're talking about chapter 10, which we are going to call Swing on a Star. This episode was directed by Anna Lily Amarpour and written by Noah Hawley and Nathaniel Halpern. Noah Hawley and Nathaniel Halpern, of course, wrote chapter 9, White Rabbit, together. Nathaniel Halpern wrote two episodes of season 1. Chapter 4, The Undiscovered, and Chapter 6, A New Day. And Noah Hawley is the creator and showrunner and the credited writer of Chapter 1, Happy Jack, and Chapter 8, If I Ruled the World. Anna Lily Amarpour has not directed Legion before, but she is an acclaimed director of films and short films. Most notably, the thing that I've heard of her for is a movie called A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night which is a vampire movie set in Iran. Mm -hmm. I had heard a lot about it and kind of wanted to see it, but I have not seen it. And now, having watched this episode, I want to see it more than ever. Absolutely, me too. So, do you want to take us through the beat-by-beat of this episode, Jen? Absolutely, I do. All right, let's get into it. We begin with a swirling pattern as David, Lenny, and Oliver are on a carousel talking about a diversion and Lenny's reality. David agrees to help Oliver and Lenny as long as no one gets hurt, but they don't exactly agree. Hmm. We flash to a stormy day in a field where Oliver meets himself at a fortune teller booth. Credits roll on the crystal ball. Trucks drive in the desert with David, Sid, Potonomy, and three Vermilions inside. Potonomy has the halo in his jacket in hopes that they find Oliver. In the field slash desert, I'm not really sure, mm-hmm. Sid finds a music box from her childhood playing a song. It upsets her, and David claims it was all a trick. Meanwhile, Oliver and Lenny break inside Division 3, killing several soldiers and turning one into a pig and another into a fish. In his lab, Mail Carey examines the orb, feeling like he may be constructed himself. Oliver stalks the hallways, stopping in at the doorway of Melanie's room, and then looking at the room of chattering teeth people, which we maybe need a better name for. (laughs) Yeah. The Infected? The Chatterers. The Chatterers? I don't know. Carrie and Oliver meet in the hallway where Oliver hurts Carrie and female Carrie emerges. Male Carrie sinks to the floor into Sid's room where Lenny stalks from the shadows and flicks his spoon. In the hallway above, Oliver grows huge and hovers over female Carrie and then disappears as David, Sid, and Potonomy return. Carrie and Carrie try to re-merge, but struggle, and then reverse with male Carrie on the inside, an arm sticking out of female Carrie's chest. Ooh. So a lot to talk about there. Yeah. The carousel with Lenny and Oliver. Mm-hmm. Lenny has a lollipop. Yes. The lollipop and the carousel are both rainbow colored. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and we begin with this big swirly swirl that's much like her lollipop as well. Yeah, and the big swirly swirl kind of solidifies into the top of the carousel. Mm-hmm. But then the pattern of it looks just like the lollipop. I think that is partly, like rainbows are, we've talked about in previous seasons, but uh, rainbows are a common image I've, of psychedelic art. Mm-hmm. And the swirling colors that she's then hold, she's in it, but she's holding it is this kind of swirling recursive imagery that is just trippy and uh, psychedelic. Mm-hmm. 
But I think there's also an element of a carousel is a closed system. It's trapped. They are trapped. They're not going anywhere. And a carousel is this thing that goes around and around and around instead of going somewhere. And then also the carousel and the lollipop are both symbols of childhood or childishness. Mm -hmm. Uh, So Lenny with the lollipop, Lenny on a carousel, David and Oliver also on the carousel, but Lenny especially, like she's associated with this childishness. And in general... Like, adults with symbols of childishness are uncanny. That's why, like, an adult slowly singing a nursery rhyme is uncanny. Adults Mm -hmm. riding on a carousel is uncanny because adults in the situations of children, it seems like the world is not as it should be, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So all that's going on with uh, the lollipop and the carousel. And then immediately here we address one of our main questions from the last episode, which is what is Lenny exactly. Yeah, exactly. I like that they address this in a lot in this episode. Yeah, and we'll come back to it later in this episode, but at this point... Yeah, the, are you Lenny from the hospital? Are you Lenny who did this and this? And she's just like, it's in your memory, man. Like, I'm whoever I want to be. Yeah. And so we start off the episode with, like, you remember it, so it happened, Mm-hmm. She says, and Oliver says, my associate is who she needs to be at this moment. Yeah. So we're starting addressing directly the reality of Lenny, mm-hmm. but also explicitly making statements on the nature of reality itself. Yes, exactly. And no one asks a uh, asparagus its opinion or whatever he says, a puma its opinion. Or asks an asparagus how it feels. An asparagus how it feels. Yeah. And this is this is definitely what we'll we'll see later on with the bloodhound and the tick is humans are the only ones who we ask an opinion about. And Oliver and Lenny both here are saying reality is what you make of it. Memory is real. Uh, if you remember it, that's as real as it needs to be. Uh, there isn't any real beneath the surface. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when he says, when Oliver says that, like, no one asks a puma its opinion, he's using that to dismiss, like, don't worry about what's real. What seems to be real is what's really real. That's all there is to it. Yeah. I think we should remember the source of these things and not necessarily take them to be the opinion of the show. Oh, no, definitely not. <laughs> on the nature of reality. Mm-hmm. And we'll have a different view on reality just a few scenes later. Yep. Um, I like how the credits roll over this crystal ball. It's above a sign that says, witness your future. Yeah. And I'm like, and this is yet another invitation of us, the audience, into the madness that we are being told on screen, witness your future. And then we're being shown this episode. And I think that's another, yeah, another invitation for the audience to be a part of this madness, to be a part of this to be questioning their own reality. There's also a degree to which this is an episode, possibly a season, full of time travel and witnessing the future. Mm -hmm. And we start off with witness your future. Witness your future. Yes, exactly. And what's the deal with, like, Oliver in a field talking to Oliver the fortune teller, like, the field which they call a desert, but it has grass. That's not how I picture a desert. It looks like a wheat field to me. Yeah. Um, and this is pretty, like, there is a phys- real physical desert with this stand that they go to in just a second, mm-hmm. but, uh, this Oliver talking to Oliver in a field is not a physical place, right? No, definitely not. I don't think so. And why are there two Olivers? Why is neither of these Farouk? I think we're definitely meant to think he is for a moment. We're meant to think this is a different person he's talking to because it takes a long time for us to see who's on the other side of the crystal ball. Yeah. And then it's just him. And it and like it makes me think that uh, the Oliver who was talking to David on the carousel was Oliver on, um, like, being directed by Farouk maybe even still possessed by Farouk, but like there, are th- there's three different psyches in for the identity of the shadow King. Right. Right. Like Farouk and Lenny and Oliver, and we'll come back to this later, but I think they're not this, they're 
individual identities inside that psychic entity. Mm -hmm. And so when Oliver comes back and reports back to Oliver, that's the Oliver identity reporting back to the amalgam identity. Mm, I think you may be right. <laughs> Maybe I'm over, um, I'm trying to over systematize it. But yeah. So we get a name for the women, the mustachioed women. <laughs> You do. That they are Vermilion, even though we saw in the credits in the previous episode them credited as Vermilion. And now we actually know we actually see them. in the text. I really like in this car ride, Patonomy and David, like, being friends. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I like uh, what David, what Patonomy says about Vermilion is, like, they may be uncomfortable at first, and then I realize that they have no memories, that they're, they're soothing for him. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is a... Is a thing you see in fiction that someone who has an ability finds someone who their ability doesn't work on, and it's really nice. Yeah, that's why uh, Edward loves uh, Bella. Bella so much. <laughs> oh, Twilight. Yes, <laughs> that is why Edward loves Bella so much. So, um, Patonomy is just like Edward, is what I'm saying. Exactly like. And so, Vermilion. Like Sorry, carry on. <laughs> so, Vermilion is a shade of green. No, vermilion is a shade of red. Vermilion is a shade of red. I always get that mixed up. Vermilion is a shade of red. You think it's a shade of green because vert is yeah, French for exactly. green. But vermilion comes from, uh, the vert in vermilion is worms. So it's like worm colored. Mm. The color of blood worms. Interesting. Yeah. And Farouk calls himself a tapeworm. Yeah. Hmm. And there's a... <sighs> My thought, anyway. in, the, in them being named after a color is significant, I feel like. A color that they aren't. A color that they aren't. Exactly. They're not familiar at all. Why are they being called this if they're not that color? Yeah. And uh, it's yet another association with red. Like we later on in the episode, we'll just get the word red and we'll get those horns, mm -hmm. those horns that signified the devil with yellow eyes in the first season. And so red is significant. The fact that they're named after a shade of red is not an accident. Yeah. And I don't think that it is, uh, that we want to believe that it's arbitrary. Mm -hmm. I don't think we want to believe that Noah Hawley just picked a word out of the dictionary. No, definitely not. Right. Um, did you notice when David says to Patonomy, like, the plan is to kill Oliver, and Patonomy says, well, we better find him first and shows him something in his pocket. Did you notice what it was? It's the halo. Yeah. Yeah. On the I first that watch, the I did not. No, me neither. I didn't get until the third watch. I didn't catch that that's what that was. Sorry, I missed that you mentioned it in the recap. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't catch it on the first what it was. I knew it wasn't like a gun, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what it was until the second or third time I watched the episode. Yeah. So that's Oliver, I mean, that's uh, Patonomy's plan. And it's interesting that Patonomy has that halo with him away from Division 3, because if it had been in Carrie's lab, maybe Carrie could have gotten it on to Oliver. Probably not. But, but maybe. he could have tried. Yeah. But, but the halo wasn't there. Right. What do we think of the music box from Sid's childhood? Yeah. I don't know. She didn't have a happy childhood. No. We already knew that. Yeah. I don't know. We don't... Maybe we'll find out eventually the exact meaning of the music box, but even if we don't, it doesn't matter what the point of it is. She had an unhappy childhood, and this music box reminds her of it. Yeah. Possibly of a specific memory... Or possibly just of her childhood in general. Yeah. I I wonder if it's linked to a, like a specific negative memory. And it's it makes total sense that she would lift it up and hear that song and be immediately transported back to her childhood because that's exactly how memory works. Yeah, absolutely. And I really, really like the visual of that. Mm -hmm. The way that the her face fades into the child, her face. Yeah. It's like, it's so very well executed. Yeah, exactly. So good. 
so well done. Mm-hmm. And the ca- like, not a uh, tiny thing, but that fade wouldn't have worked if they hadn't cast someone who looks so much like Rachel Keller as a yeah, child. Yeah, absolutely. The, they, that was good casting. Girl they cast as young her has the same eyes. Yeah. Which really sells it. And then I love, Adelso don't love, but uh, Oliver and Lenny like singing and killing people. Yes. Well, it's very similar to the first season when David goes to Division 3 and kills people with his like dancing and snapping and killing. Yeah, and what's on the other side? We really see the Shadow King's MO. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. And if there was, which I don't think there is, but if there was any doubt that like David was actually the one killing people in Division 3, we now have... Super yeah. confirmation that that was the Shadow King because Inclusive. look, he's doing it exactly the same way. Yep, exactly. Um, and also just like, <laughs> it's so unnerving. It's actually, they're actually like funny and charming, turning people into dust and pigs and fish. Like, no, it's really unnerving. Yeah. And the way the song in the music box becomes the song that they're singing as well. Yeah. It's just really well done. Yep. Um, I didn't catch. Until, I think, the third time of watching it again. Uh, later on, Clark's going to say they scared some children. Yeah. And I didn't catch that the people in helmets are children. they don't kill are children. That's why, possibly why they don't kill them? I think for the show, that's why. I think for the show, them disintegrating a bunch of children into dust would have been a little too much. Yes, exactly. Uh, I... Unfortunately, I think this is just a straight up mistake on the shooting of that scene and the look of that scene is that it's, I could not tell that those were children. I could. I noticed, oh, yeah? I thought they were children right away. Right away? Okay. They're small Maybe and I'm wrong. Oliver like bends down to talk to them. Okay. Fair enough. And they're the same people from the first episode when David says, why are they children? Mm. I couldn't tell in that episode that they were children until yes. David asked why they were. Okay. But in Fair this enough. episode, I could see they were children. Okay. And then we have Carrie tinkering with the orb and saying that uh, at first he thought it was Shi'ar. Mm-hmm. Do you, Jan, know what Shi'ar is? I did not until this episode, but uh, you then explained it immediately. <laughs> so now so, I do. Shi'ar, it, this is like a massive X-Men Easter egg. Uh, or possibly not an Easter egg, possibly a plot point. I suspect not. I suspect it's just like a world-building connection. But the Shi'ar are one of the three major alien species in mm. Marvel Comics. The three are the Kree, who are big in Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. That's like... Uh, and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Kree are very known. Yeah. In the Ronan the Accuser world. is a Kree. Yeah. And then the Skrull who haven't really shown up yet in any of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but the Kree and the Skrull are at war, uh, and the Skrull invade Earth and blah, 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 and do stuff. And the other one are the Shi'ar. And the Shi'ar are most... I mostly know from watching the 90s X-Men cartoon, in the 90s X-Men cartoon, and in the comics too, but I know from the 90s X-Men cartoon, uh, Professor X is married to the, like, queen of the Shi'ar, Lalandra. Really? Yes. That's not David's mother, though. Nope. Hmm. So I wonder That's whether they're, like, Lalandra is going to be feature in Legion. I kind of suspect not. But maybe in, like, as a story. Yeah. Who knows? Also, Carrie thinks that he made the orb. He probably did. He probably did. Who called that? At the end of season one, yours truly. <laughs> I I won't say that it was was the only thing that I gave, but I definitely thought that that might be. And I mean, frankly, they told us. Yeah, is that one of Carrie's? David says, is that one of Carrie's? Exactly. And yes. And yes, it seems like it was. And then we see Oliver and then Farouk standing, looking at the chattering teeth people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to call, I don't know what to call the Chattering Teeth people, but I do want to call the room where the Chattering Teeth people are. I want to name that the Chattery. Okay. (laughs) Sounds good. So 
And I immediate, my immediate thought, I think this episode does not bear out my immediate thought, but I'm going to put it out there anyway in case it does turn out to be the case. But when Oliver stood in front of the chattery, I was like, oh, are those guys a Trojan horse? Mm-hmm. Like Oliver has infected all these people and they brought them, or the Shadow King has infected all these people and Division Three has just brought them in. Yeah. So that's, I think that isn't in this case, but I feel like that's not very far off. I think that's a, and they're being kind of stupid by just taking them there and putting them in a room together. Yeah. So I'm calling, uh, with less confidence by the end of this episode than I had at this moment in the episode, but I'm still calling that those, the chattering people are a Trojan horse of the Shadow King somehow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So just to be clear, David and Lenny, I mean, uh, sorry, Oliver and Lenny came to Division 3 to retrieve the monk and then didn't find him and left? Yeah, that's, th yes. Okay. Because, yeah. Their purpose there was to find the monk of the Migo order. Mm-hmm. And when they couldn't find him, they just left. I think so, my, my understanding is they left before David returned. Or because David returned. Or like because, they basically left the minute he did. Yeah. It's just, I mean, the question that's going to hover over this and into the next episode is, how come they didn't find the monk? Because he seems to be there. Yeah. Or was he not there at that point? That's just a good question. Maybe we'll talk about more, that more at the end. Maybe we will. Two more real thoughts before we leave this section mm -hmm. to say quickly. And one is, Lenny, when she's creeping up on male Carrie, starts in the shadows with yellow eyes. Yes. That was uh, super creepy. And like the way that she creeps low, like so creepy, so well done, and so mm -hmm. incredibly unsettling. And then the yellow eyes, of course, is a callback to the devil with the yellow eyes. Well, what do we think of her like flicking his spoon? Yeah, I wonder why does he hold up that spoon? What is that in his mind supposed to be doing? And how is she outside? Like how isn't she like within Oliver, how is she outside doing things? She's like a projection. Like flicking the spoon really seems to be evidence that she's tangible. Yes, exactly. Oliver doesn't ever touch anything, uh, but she, but Lenny does. Mm-hmm. Right? So Oliver, what we see on screen as Oliver's body could very well be a psychic projection of a body that isn't there at all. Well, especially when he gets so huge like he does. Yeah. And hovers over Carrie. And maybe, I mean, like, clearly the Shadow King is like David. The Shadow King is not just telepathic, he's telekinetic. Mm -hmm. Right? And if we didn't know that already, which we do, but if we didn't know that already, like, turning people into a pig, that's not telepathy. Yes, good call. So, flicking the spoon, I think... Uh, the way that the spoon reacts is not the way it would react if a person hit it with their finger. Yeah. So I don't think we need to believe that a physical Lenny's physical body physically touched Carrie's spoon and made that happen. Mm -hmm. I think it can still be a psychic projection that interacts with the world as if physically because of telekinetic telekinesis. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Make sense? I think so. I think so. Not, you know, how do the powers work? <laughs> and the other thing I just want to say before we move on from this is how incredibly upsetting and incredible and cool uh, the arm sticking out of Cherry's, of Carrie's stomach. Yeah, is. absolutely. Like, that is such a cool and disturbing effect. Mm -hmm. It's really good. It's yeah. really, really well done. Yeah. And the terrified look on her face. Yeah. Is, yeah, really well done. Melanie does drugs again with her elephant. She lies in bed and hears Oliver's thoughts. They speak of a monk. They then discuss this with Ed Admiral Fukuyama and Vermilion. These monks, the Migo monks, know where Farouk's body is. But the Vermilion accuse da David of lying. In the lab, Carrie tries to talk to 
carry inside of her, and David comes in asking to use the tank again. Carrie helps her with much trouble, and he travels through crazy, swirly world to see Sid again. She tells him that he is sweet like this and hints that he might be dead in the future. She also tells him that Farouk kills a few, but this thing kills everyone. The conversation with David and uh, Fukuyama and the Vermilions. Yep. Well, the few things. I mean, first, there's this irony that we viewers recognize of Sid being so offended on David's behalf that they would accuse him of lying. Yeah, when we know he is. When we know that he is. And it's interesting that uh, Sid asks Melanie to defend David, and Melanie does not actually claim that David isn't lying. Mm -hmm. She says, don't piss him off because he's her only chance. She doesn't say he's telling the truth. So does Melanie recognize that he might be lying, or does she just not care? Both. I think that Melanie doesn't trust David. No one trusts David as much as Sid does. Yeah. And Melanie is extremely jaded now. Yeah. That's true. And so, but she just wants the Shadow King dead. And Melanie talks about, uh, Melanie and Fukuyama talk about Miser Sunday, Mm -hmm. who destroyed the Migo monks. Is that someone from X-Men? Not as far as I know. Okay. And I looked it up, I googled it, and found only references to this episode of Legion. Mm, Which that seems like it's not. So I think it is not from anything except this. And I'm really very curious about whether this is just a little detail of world building or whether this is something that is going to be significant and we're going to come back to. Mm -hmm. Are we ever going to find out anything about Miser Sunday? Or, uh, while we're on the subject, the... uh, Lazarus affair, yeah, or exactly. from last season, the what's it? What was the it? Equinox. The equinox. Like there, there's references to things that we. What's the purpose of that? I think you're right in that it's not necessarily going to be explained or explored, and it's it's showing a bigger world, a world outside of David. Yeah, the world is much bigger than some guy named David. <laughs> Some guy named David and his, and sister, his sister, which, oh, is Amy going to come back in this season to I side know. note? That is a big side note. I'm a little sad that she's just completely gone. I really hope that she does, uh, partly because I like Katie Duplass, but also because, like, David's sister's important to him. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's total ta- tangent. Yeah. I agree. I think that it is making the world bigger. Like... There's there's a speculation in among Legion fans that all of the first season just all happened inside David's head and all of the characters that we've seen are, you know, multiple personality projections of David's mind. Mm-hmm. I never agreed with that. I never thought that was the case. Um, it's an interesting theory to entertain, but it doesn't pan out. Yeah, I don't think so. And I think that things like Miser Sunday and the Lazarus Affair are breadcrumbs, clues to us that, no, there is a world beyond David. Mm -hmm. There's things that are before his time that we never are going to find out about because they're there. Their purpose in the show is to show us that the world is bigger than him. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's my theory. That's my reading of these things. So I suspect we're never going to hear anything about Miser Sunday. Yeah. Or the Lazarus Affair. Well, and we know that Professor X had David like 30 years ago. Right. Like David is about 30 years old. Yeah. And so we know that that whole thing happened 30 years ago. And then we know that Summerland was founded after that or around that time. Yeah. So like it's things happened a long time ago and they happened even before some of the stuff was founded. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, there's definitely a long history. And I wonder, like, is this, uh, in terms of official continuity, I am generally not one to get too hung up on official continuity. I think it is a, uh, sink pit. Yep. But just to entertain it for a moment, is this in the same official continuity as the X-Men movies? 
Hmm. I really hope not. <laughs> uh, because, like, that gives us a bit of a sense of where, how well-known mutants are and things that have happened in the past mm-hmm. is all. Yeah. And then in this, co- oh, and then we go, I love the shot from Fukuyama's perspective through the basket. He's looking at different things for a second and yeah. he sees what's in front of him, but he also sees like projections of other things throughout the, uh, the compound. The, yeah. And then David touches the dirt and gets a psychic flash of Lenny and Oliver turning people into dirt. Mm-hmm. And I love because of how like, I love it because it's so disturbing. Mm-hmm. The uh, vacuuming up the dirt. Yeah. As if it's just dirt. When, yep. like, we just were reminded very uh, emphatically that these used to be people. Yep. And they're just, like, swiffering it up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, that's really, there's, that's really upsetting. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, uh, this view of, that Fukuyama has of all the different things reminds me of the first season when we see all, like, the television screens. Yeah. That have, like, David's thoughts and memories in his head. And that we get this sense of, like, Fukuyama is seeing everything. And possibly that's what the security system was in previous Division 3. Hmm. Because in previous Division 3, we had these, like, flat canvas things with, with that were TV screens somehow. Right. That weren't actually anything to do with technology. They were, like, pieces of fabric. Yeah. So possibly Fukuyama was that security system all along. Yeah, maybe. Hmm. Or not security so much as observation. That's my new theory. That is interesting. And in this scene, and later when he's talking to uh, Carrie, which we can move on to, Mm -hmm. uh, the voices in David's head continue to exist and continue yes. to be a great effect, I think. Well, I They're, love, I love that Carrie is lying there talking to other Carrie in her head and having a conversation. And then David comes in and David is also having a conversation yeah. in his head. How does that work? How is that any different from the conversation between Carrie and Carrie? Yeah, I think exactly. I think exactly. Uh, we're paralleling Carrie and Carrie with David because they're both talking to a different version of themselves inside their heads. Mm -hmm. And we're also paralleling, uh, parallel isn't really a verb. We're also drawing a parallel between Fukuyama and David Mm -hmm. because again, they're like, they're talking amongst themselves, but also out loud, but also for each other at the same time. And in both of those scenes, we have the Vermilion speaking for, uh, Fukuyama and then David having a conversation inside his head. Yep. And then a scene later we have Carrie talking to herself inside her head and David talking to himself inside her head, his head. I think you're totally like, what is the difference? Mm -hmm. Carrie's inside Carrie. Different David minds are inside different David's minds. Is there a difference? Is that like, it's not just an internal monologue the way TV characters sometimes have internal monologues. Mm-hmm. They're like different voices of David's voice arguing with each other. Yeah. And I like, I wonder what has happened to David psychologically to make that happen. Cause that didn't used to be how he worked. Yeah, absolutely. Is this like the lingering effect of the split that happened at the end of season one that caused David's rational mind to emerge mm-hmm. that has just continued. And then we have we have David in the isolation tank. I love the again. I'm I'm really loving the the visuals of this episode. Yes, and the distorted visuals of David's face while he's in that and body while he's in the isolation tank. Yeah, I think look great. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it reminds me of like wrinkle in time and tessellating, and like he's his whole body is like messed up because he's trying to move time. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then when he's talking to future Sid again, in terms of just like, I love the static, the way the sound fuzzes out and the picture picture fuzzes blips. blips. I think it looks really good and really effective as like 
he can't quite hear her. He's not, he's there, but he's not there. He's experiencing it, but he's not. Yeah. I think it looks great. What do you think of the jellyfish? He goes in yeah. and there's a porthole. He looks out and there's jellyfish. Like, are they underwater somehow? Is I mean, that how they're surviving? She says that they hide. Mm-hmm. I didn't think till you just said it. I didn't know what to make of the jellyfish, but you just said, are they underwater? And as soon as you said it, I thought, yeah, that's the answer. They're it's not the jellyfish hiding. itself that is significant necessarily. Mm-hmm. It's their sea life because where they are hiding is underwater. Yeah. I absolutely think that now think that's since you just said that. <laughs> The glowing door frames in this, too, are just like the glowing door frames in the club. Yes. So, like, is that a real place? Is any of this, uh, I mean, real is a difficult word, but. And then when she shows up, like, uh, he, I forget what he says, but the first thing she says is possible. And then it's like fuzz, fuzzed out. Mm-hmm. She says, he says, you know. I'm here to see you in the future. And she says, possible. Impossible for you to be here. But what we actually hear is she's not the future Sid. She's possible Sid. Hmm. The reason the first thing she says is possible is because the show is telling us this is a possible future, not the future. Well, it drives me crazy that she says I'm from and he interrupts her with (laughs) the future. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no, never interrupt someone who's telling you where they're from because she might not have been saying that. And I feel like that's a big clue to she wasn't necessarily saying that. Yeah. What she says, I I think, yeah, she's from a possible future, not the future. Mm -hmm. And yes, if you, dear listeners, are ever transported somewhere that you don't recognize and you meet someone that you think you might know, just like give them some space to explain who they are and where they are. Don't presume all over them yeah exactly. that's not smart just in general that's good advice <laughs> that's also just like how to be polite to people she's in major shadow in this scene but i think she's not wearing the necklace hmm. like she was in the first time we saw her in the future once again i failed to pay attention to the necklace even though i should have because you pointed it out last time <laughs> I feel like the necklace is extremely significant. I think you're right, and I feel dumb for once again not noticing it. But I did notice uh, she only has one arm. Really? Yes. How did I not notice that? (laughs) She's missing an arm. What? And on the first watch, I, like, wondered whether it was just in shadow. But on the second watch, we see clearly, like, a stump. Wow. I don't know how I missed that. That's crazy. So it's like, yeah, battle scarred Sid. Yeah. Wow. The future has been hard, she says, in words, but we also see on her body yeah. that, like, she's been through a lot. She isn't like she used to be, and she says time will do that to a person. Yeah. And that's partly she looks tired and sad and a little older, but also her she's missing an arm. Wow. So Rachel at Bueno Bueno on Twitter, asked us to speculate about future Sid. I think we would have anyway, but we are absolutely happy to. Do we trust future Sid? Is she real? Is she really from the future? David trusts her because she's Sid, but do we? I'm not very trusting of her. I The fact that she is telling him to find Farouk's body is suspicious as hell. I think she is, I don't think that this Sid that we met this episode is necessarily the same Sid we met in the orb. Hmm. I think that... Because she acts very surprised to see him. Very surprised to see him. I think that there is, like you said, possible futures and this is one of the, like, you know, darkest timeline or whatever. It's, uh... It's Sid. It is actually Sid, but mm-hmm. it's not it's not Sid for the forces of good necessarily. I think uh, that distrust of Sid is a red herring. Mm. I think she is who she says she is. 
I don't think necessarily the course of action she's advising him to take is the best course of action. Like mm-hmm. she may have be making a mistake mm-hmm. or may not be, but I think she's telling the truth as she knows it and is who she says she is. That's my theory. Mm-hmm. I think she really is from the future. She really is Sid. And everything she tells him is true as far as she knows. Hmm. So okay. that's my, I'm going to take that stance. <laughs> uh, and we will just see. I think definitely the show is giving us reason to doubt her. Oh, yes. Plenty a lot of, of reasons, reason to doubt yeah. her. But I think that they're, that the doubts are what's uh, a misdirection. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. I can see that. So... David, uh, she says, I never thought I would see you again like this. Mm-hmm. And he says, what, am I dead in the future? And she says, it's complicated. Yeah. Which means no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but she kind of says, like, yeah, you're dead, except no. She says, it's complicated. So I'm guessing he's evil. Yeah, exactly. That's what I think. Yeah. Um, I think, like, I mean, I think it's complicated means definitely no. Definitely he is not dead. Yeah. Because yes is not complicated. Yeah. Uh, or in like a coma, in a, una- like, just like Oliver was, unable to get out of the astral plane. When she says... Any given number of things. When she says, I never thought I'd see you again like this. Like this. She doesn't say, I never thought I'd see you again. And when she talks about him, she says, like, you're, like, you were so sweet. So future David is not sweet. Mm-hmm. Future David, I mean, this is, um, we had another person on Twitter, Valen, at Valar Mousp. I can't pronounce your Twitter handle, I'm sorry. Uh, asked what happens to David in the future. Uh, does he no longer exist or he can't surface? And I definitely think... Just like we see Sid has changed, I think David has changed. And they are no longer, I think, fighting on the same side. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And whether that means that he's evil or she is, she believes that he's evil. And I think she's right. Yeah. But I think the show gives us room to uh, conclude that he's still good and she's evil now. Mm-hmm. Or something. But my theory... Is he's, I don't think he is possessed by another parasite, but I think he's no longer sweet. Yep. Uh, and she says even like a week from now, you bashed Farouk's head in. Yeah. So like, I can't see our David bashing someone's head in. Yep. Absolutely. So this change happens now. Yep. Right? Well, except she says a week from now, how how does she know when he's from? Yeah, that's an excellent that question. That was a weird comment. And then she says it started as an egg. Yeah. She's <laughs> quoting the, the stories that we heard last episode. So she's heard the narrator she's, also. Yeah. She knows the narrator. <laughs> yeah. And then the... Yeah. It started like another, like anything else. The idea... Uh, is what's the problem. And the question that I also, the other question I have about that is, is this idea in the future that is an egg that it kills everyone, this thing, is that the catalyst or is it something else? Like I just the, don't know. The chattery catalyst. I think we are encouraged to believe that the chattery catalyst is the plague that is gone wild in the future. But I wonder, because the Chattery Catalyst is was Oliver was doing it, but now she wants Farouk to help them stop it. Yeah, exactly. So either present Sid, who told David that Oliver's behind the Chattery Catalyst, is wrong, mm-hmm. or future Sid is wrong that Farouk will be able to or willing to stop it, or that it's not the same thing. It's a different plague. What do you think of those options? I think that Farouk is not causing the chattery teeth. I think it's just correlation that they're finding them near where Oliver was. And present Sid assumes that that means Oliver's doing it, but he's not. Yeah. And the way that Oliver like stares at the chattery teeth when he invades Division 3. Yeah, it kind of implies that he doesn't necessarily know. 
Right? Yep. I think you may very well be right, but I'm going to speculate that the plague in the future is just not the chattery teeth. It's a different thing. Okay. I think it is. I'm going to come down the side of it is. Okay. We'll see who is right and who is dead. You have a better track record for predicting what's going to happen. I do. I'm feeling pretty good about myself these days. The whole time travel thing, I was really spot on about. Okay, so moving on. We get a title card uh, in in label font. (laughs) Chapter 4, Umwelt. 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 There's a voiceover by John Hamm again talking about reality is that which when you stop believing it, it doesn't go away. He talks about a tick and a dog and how they don't think about their role, but humans do. We see Oliver teaching a child about red and green incorrectly so that the child is hit by a car. And in conclusion, humans are the only animals on earth that go mad. (laughs) So there's a lot to unpack here. (laughs) Yeah. First of all, uh, what is Umwelt? Do you know? No, what is Umwelt? Umwelt uh, is German for just environment, mm-hmm. but in English it means like the scientific concept of a biological organism's uh, context and way of life or whatever. So like it's fairly accurately when John Hamm says a tick uh, sucks blood and that's its entire way of living like that's mm-hmm. he's he's explaining what umwelt is that's okay. what that means um and that's like a metaphor in this section to the way that you your sense the way that you've been taught and the way that you interpret your senses is what determines your reality right right okay because a tick's reality is sucking blood and there isn't anything more to their reality than that. And we're coming back to Oliver saying, no one ever asked an asparagus for its feelings. Yeah, exactly. That your interpretation of an experience of the world is what the world is. Like, and Umwelt is a bit of a uh, way of putting that not in the sense that... Um, not in the sense that your beliefs define what happens in the world outside you, but that your interaction with the world is through your understanding of it and that those are not separable concepts. Mm -hmm. Right? We have that quote, reality is what that which when you stop believing in it, it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. That's a quote uh, from Philip K. Dick, by the way. Oh, really? Uh, As far as I know, it's not from any of his fiction. It's from like a speech he gave. Hmm. Uh, about science fiction writers. And what's the... Yeah, oh, I'm rambling a little because there's so much to unpack here, right? Yeah, even something as small as the bloodhound, like there's text on the screen that doesn't get read out loud. So if you go and read the text, one of the texts about the bloodhounds is that this particular breed of bloodhound was bred by monks. And you're like, they're m- talking about monks. Is This is not... a mistake that they would put that on the screen and it's a tick in this episode we have Farouk call himself the tapeworm Mm -hmm. and Farouk all last season was referred to as a parasite yeah so like a tick is a reference to Farouk as a parasite why a tick of all things because you're talking about being a blood-sucking parasite like and they say that it's often referred to as an insect but it's actually an arachnid is like you believe one thing about this this parasite, but it's actually something else. Yeah, absolutely. So is that saying something about Farouk? Yeah. That he's not what we think. I mean, is it saying something about going forward, or is it commenting back on what we've already seen? Because David thought Farouk was one thing, and he wasn't. Mm-hmm. It's both. Uh, it could be either or both. And what's the... Di- why... Uh, the Philip K. Dick quote, why is that tattooed on someone's back? Hmm. Because it looks cool? Maybe. <laughs> it could be the monks with a tattoo on their back. It looks, the person that's tattooed on is bald and wearing like a white cloth. And it seems like, in some ways, it seems like that uh, 
statement, reality is that which when you stop believing in it, it doesn't go away, almost seems at odds with everything that's ha- that he says next. Absolutely. Right? Yep. So are those at odds? Or is he saying, like, would... Well, no, it isn't at odds with, like, the reality is this is red and this is green. And if you ignore the red and green, that doesn't stop it from... From being from that. From being that. If you... If you're incorrect, if you're incorrect about what red and green are, that doesn't stop you from getting hit by a car. So we agree as humans, we have to agree on reality, but also what we agree on doesn't actually change what is. Yeah. So that means if as humans, we need to agree on reality and reality is that which if you don't stop believing in it, it doesn't go away. Then specifically what makes you mad is disagreeing with everyone else yes yes, right exactly because red and green as stop and go lights those are not uh those are arbitrary Mm -hmm. right so thinking red is green and green is red uh makes you out of touch with reality exactly and only because it makes you out of touch with consensus Mm -hmm. right and so what madness is by this definition is seeing the world differently from how everyone else sees it. Yes, exactly. Right? Yeah. And so it's not actually about your reference to the real world as it really exists. It's about your reference or lack of reference to the consensus that everyone else holds. Mm -hmm. We have the story here of imagine a boy who was taught that red is green and green is red. Yeah. Who has been taught wrong? Who is this boy? Is that supposed to be David? Maybe? Like, clearly he's not literally. No. But like, is this an allegory for David's life? And if so, what has David been taught wrong? Well, everything he believed about himself before the series started was wrong. Yeah. But. That seems like first season issues of, like, he thought that he was mad, but in fact he was a mutant, but maybe he was mad as well as being a mutant. And now he, his orientation in the world, like, how can he agree with consensus? Right? What did the stars say? What did the stars say? (laughs) We must agree on what is real. David has a hard time ever knowing what's real. Yeah. I feel like this uh, this is a wild speculation, but Mm -hmm. this experiment that they show where you have Oliver and his child and he's watching the child go and get hit by a car and he like takes out his notebook and makes notes. I feel like maybe this is when Farouk was first figuring out his powers and getting really powerful before he lost his body, he would do things like this. Hmm. He would take a child and raise them to think that the opposite was true, just to be like, oh, that's what happened. Yeah. I mean, if Farouk's been around since the 1800s. Exactly. Was it the 1800s or the 18th century? 1800s. Yeah. Early 1800s. If Farouk's been around since the 1800s, and he definitely has a real sense of whimsy. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. But, like... Spending some time to miseducate someone and watch them die. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, exactly. It does seem in character. Yeah, that's kind of what made me think that. Hmm. He's doing that because he thinks he's God and he is just kind of playing around with people. It's like when you have like a... It's like all the people are sims to him. And he's (laughs) like, what happens if I just take away the ladder while they're in the swimming pool? Oh, they drown. You did that, didn't you? Well, yeah. (laughs) Oh, Jan. Those poor Sims. Those poor Sims. Hmm. So that's my theory. It's kind of out there. Yeah, I don't think so, but it's interesting. Mm -hmm. So David meets Clark outside Division 3, and they go into the restaurant. Clark is upset and accuses David of collusion. David walks down the hallway and passes by a trail of grease on the ground Mm -hmm. and then meditates to go into, I assume, the astral plane. Mm -hmm. 
He's in the same field, but this time it's sunny out. At the fortune teller booth, he meets Farouk. Farouk speaks multiple languages and calls them both gods, telling David he is the creator of reality. Inside David's mind, they wrestle. Then Farouk becomes a samurai and David becomes a tank before wrestling again and David manages to pin Farouk down. David convinces him not to kill anyone on his quest to find his body. David says he'll find the monk at Division 3, and David exits. But we stay on Farouk as Lenny appears. She wants to be free and back to her life, but Farouk just keeps asking her what happens after. I love Clark. And I love him more in this season than in the last season. Absolutely. He is swiftly becoming a favorite of mine. I love his, like, I feel like this is our place. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Exactly. He's, like, hitting this uh, sweet spot between charming and, like, sickest of burns. Everything he says is, like, so cutting, and yet he's so, like, shows, I don't know, he's great, and I love him. And, like... He's so, like, you really see his perspective is, is like, David's like, I thought you were the bad guy. And he's like, no, you're the bad guy. You're the one who put office supplies in my face (laughs) and burnt half my body. How are you not the bad guy here? And, like, you're like, yeah, that's that's right. Except he does, he, like, says it so calmly. Yeah, exactly. you're going to throw, shove some more office supplies in my face? Like, he doesn't get out, get riled up. No, not at all. Man. He's great. And yeah, they each think each other are the bad guy. And that's partly, I think, a statement back to reality is, uh, as you perceive it, Mm -hmm. they each are the bad guy to each other. I really like that, especially because of chapter eight of season, like the last episode of season one, uh, we have a real grounding in Clark's perspective Mm -hmm. and we can really see. I think in this episode we could anyway, but we have extra grounds to see things from his perspective because they gave us that in the season finale of season one. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, uh, maybe David is the bad guy. And that David says that Clark being the bad guy, like the, in context, he's saying that to justify him shoving off his supplies in his face and burning half his body. Yeah. Like he could do that was okay to do because Clark was the bad guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean Clark did have him tied up in a pool and was going to electrocute him. So like it's not like he wasn't the bad guy in that situation. I know, and I like too that even though they're antagonists again, I think they like each other. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think especially like again from episode eight, uh, from chapter eight. If I ruled the world. If I ruled the world. Sid says to Clark, I may be wrong, but I think you like David. And I really see in this episode still, like, Clark does like David, mm-hmm. even though he doesn't trust him. Yep. Uh, there's some sincerity to, like, I feel like this is our place. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it and him and this whole conversation, and it's great. And we have, uh, yeah. I just want to mention the shot of, there's an overhead shot when Clark, Clark and David meet. Before they kind of walk on frame, it's it's steps, but they're very sandy colored, and it looks like a desert mm-hmm. with waves of of desert. Hmm. And and then suddenly these people walk into the frame, and you're like, oh, that wasn't what I was expecting. Right. And it's again this unexpected framing of shots where you think you're seeing one thing, and then it's completely a different thing. Which is like a major motif in this season and show. Yeah, exactly. This time in the conversation, by the way, we see Clark's unburned side almost the whole time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the burns are in shadow. Yes, they are. And then we have, okay, what is up with the black tar trail on the ground? Mm-hmm. Like the black tra- the black tar is a trail left by the black bad idea delusion that hatched from the egg. Mm -hmm. It's also, uh, Lenny was covered in black tar in 
if I ruled the world. Yes. And just like making footsteps in the astral plane. Mm-hmm. So there's that connection strengthened. Yeah. But how is that thing leaving Black Tar in Division 3? Like, is that bad idea physically in the world? I think so. That's... That's weird. It's weird. But I think that that weird black creature thing is somehow alive and in the world. And maybe that's the infection. Or maybe that's... Yeah, I'm not sure. But there yeah. was there was trails in the first episode as well. So this is yep. not the first time we've seen this. This is around. In the first episode, I thought the trail was in the astral plane white room where Sid and David were doing it. There was also a trail that that Sid was looking at on the floor and it was unclear whether it was water or something else. Mm, right. And then we have David in the desert or wheat field. The text calls it a desert. It's awfully grassy for a desert. Yep. But uh, I noticed, it kind of occurred to me uh, this time, even though we've seen the fortune teller uh, table before, that a fortune teller is a different kind of psychic. Hmm, yep. Right? And, then and we, if if Farouk has been around since the early 1800s, possibly he worked as a fortune teller in this way to make money. Well, and he talks about his the gray uh, thing, the brain, yeah. is a muscle and you have to strengthen it. So maybe doing this kind of fortune telling was how he strengthened his mind at one yeah, point. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's part of like the carousel is a carnival game and this is another carnival thing. Yeah, for sure. And Farouk tells David, you decide what is real and what is not. Mm-hmm. Which is back again to, like, what Oliver said in the very first scene. Yep. And to the narrator tells us reality is what doesn't go away when you don't believe in it. And Farouk says, you decide what's real. Mm-hmm. Like, Farouk is really rejecting that Reality is what, when you stop believing it, it doesn't go away. He says, you can decide. You can just make things real by deciding that they are. Mm-hmm. And then Farouk speaks in a whole bunch of different languages. And there's two aspects of that that I think are worth thinking about. One is, like, why does he speak in so many different languages? What is that about? I think that shows his age. Maybe. And he speaks in, I'll say he speaks in at least four because yeah. he speaks English, French, German, and something I don't understand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sounds Arabic to me, but I don't speak Arabic at all. But one of the languages he speaks sounds Arabic to me. Mm-hmm. And it, then he speaks something else that doesn't sound Arabic to me mm-hmm. that also I don't understand. So he speaks a bunch of different languages. Is that showing his age? Is it an, uh, like connected to age maybe, I think, more uh, relevant is like his experience and knowledge, mm-hmm. which comes from age, but yeah. like. He also, David can understand him. Somehow. Yeah, that was the other thing I was going to say. Does David, like, how come David understands those different languages? He's not speaking different languages to try to, uh, like, confuse David or whatever. Yeah. So those languages are not in any way a barrier to communication. Yeah. Right? They're in effect for us, the viewer, not for David. Mm -hmm. David doesn't react at all to whether he's speaking different languages. We don't see any evidence that David even notices that he's speaking a bunch of different languages. Mm. Yeah. So it's for us to see that he is uh, difficult to understand and that his knowledge is broader than David's, maybe? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. And he speaks to David like he's, you know, teaching him how to be a psychic. Yeah. Like there's a real mentor. Teaching him how to be a god in his mind. Yeah, totally. You have to get up from, what is the word? Kids table. Yeah. Uh, I really like this actor, by the way. Yeah, I think he does a great job. I think he's really compelling in the way that he's so, he's he's charming, Mm -hmm. frankly. Yep. Uh, in a really off-putting way. Yeah, exactly. Which is what I would hope yeah, he would be. Absolutely. Yeah. They go into like David's oh into David's eye, and I guess into David's mind when they're doing the, like the whole wrestling thing. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting how they go from like 
wrestling in their little singlets <laughs> to Farouk turns into a samurai and David turns into a tank. So it's like Farouk is like, well, let's up the ante. Let's go the next level up. And David's like, no, I'm going to go to the end game. Right. I'm not going to do this one step at a time. Yeah. With you. Which is that showing, and David does end up pinning him at the end. So does that show that David is actually stronger? I think David's definitely stronger. I think we see that. I think we've seen that all along. Mm -hmm. Even in the first season when Lenny is talking to David, when the Shadow King has Lenny is talking to David in uh, near the end of season one. Mm. She's like, I need your mind because it's, you know, the source of your power. And I wasn't strong enough and I'm getting strong enough, but I need you. Hmm. Uh, I think David trained and uh, with Farouk's experience and knowledge and uh, maybe ruthlessness. Yeah. I think David's stronger than Farouk. And when they're wrestling, like, Farouk kind of acknowledges, strong, very strong, but you're playing the wrong game. And that's when he shifts because when they're on equal footing, David's going to win. Hmm. So Farouk yeah. has to change the game to be able to keep up with David. And he plays it as like, ha ha, I'm playing when toying with you. But it really is David stronger than he is. Yeah, absolutely. I like, we passed quickly by, but uh, one of the lines that I missed the first time when they're wrestling, <laughs> David keeps, and um, when David and Farouk are wrestling, Farouk keeps saying, oh, physical, very physical. Uh, actually, I'm going to pause on that before I get to my point to say, but it's not physical at all. Yeah. Physical, physical. They're in a psychic mind. They're in an astral plane in an astral plane. They're double unphysical. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And so manifesting this psychic struggling as a physical wrestling, the most physical kind of wrestling is even more physical than boxing. Yeah. Because you're touching the whole time with your body. And he says, physical, physical, very, what's the word? Homoerotic. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't catch that any of the times that I watched it. It's really funny. I didn't catch it till the third time, but because I, I stopped and was like, I don't catch what word he says. Hmm. That he he says it's homoerotic, and I think that's hilarious. That is hilarious because there's a because uh, Farouk is Lenny, and Lenny is totally uh, displays sexual interest in David. Yes, absolutely. In man, sexually manipulating David. Yeah. So I like that that remains consistent yep. in Farouk's character. Well, and David, the physicalness, David is used to using his physical body on the astral plane because that's where him and Sid go to have sex. Yeah, So, totally. like, this is something he is very uh, good at is being physical in a different, outside of physical reality. You said when we were watching it, and I'm going to steal your line, that this fight scene is like Merlin and Madame Mim from yeah. The Sword in the Stone. The Sword in the Stone. That we shift from seeing it as a physical battle to seeing it as a, a matter of imagination. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, I said that, and then it didn't really end up being one-upmanship for very long. I felt like it was going to be, and then it wasn't. I think but it I liked still the way is, it was. Yeah. And you said David pins Farouk, and he does, maybe it's just posturing on Farouk's part, but it really plays to me like this wrestling scene ends in an impasse. Mm, Yeah. They come out of his brain before they can really conclude anything. Yeah, because, like, he has Farouk pinned, sort of, but Farouk is still, like, not giving up. Uh, He says he has him pinned physically and is trying to convince him to do something mm-hmm. and Farouk's like, or what? What are you going to do if I don't? Uh, and then they come back out and he, like they begrudgingly come to an agreement, but I think it would be foolish for David. It would still be foolish for David to trust Farouk's word yeah, at this point. Absolutely. There's no, re- he has no reason to trust his word at all. The, Camera staying with Farouk after David exits was so shocking to me. Yes. I just kept being like, is it really staying with him? Is it really staying with him? And then it stays with him for so long. And then Lenny appears. Because like, oh. The eye of the camera has a lot to do with who's the protagonist. Yeah. 
we sometimes see a villain's perspective, but when the camera stays on someone, it's because it's their story. Yeah. So it's staying on Farouk makes Farouk the protagonist of this section of the story instead of the antagonist. Yeah. We don't do that very often. No. And especially, like, there's a difference between cutting to the villain and finding out what they're doing mm-hmm. and having like, we have a scene with two characters. One of them leaves and we stay with the other because the one we stay with is the one we care about. Yep. So we care about Farouk and not David. Yep. It's, I mean, I feel like this is yet another invitation to madness. This is like not what a TV show does. Yeah. Is that the main character leaves and we stay with this side character that we literally just met. Yeah, totally. Totally. Like the Shadow King we've met, but Farouk. Yeah. I, I, yeah, it's absolutely disorienting again in a different way from disorienting camera shots. Disorienting in terms of what we expect of the structure of a television show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I absolutely love, speaking of direction, uh, him like wiping the fortune teller booth. Off the thumb. lens with his thumb. Yeah. Like, I think that is a am- fantastic shot mm-hmm. that I then, really love. And then zippering out of the whole thing into just whiteness. It really demonstrates his control over the world. Yeah. In a way that we have never seen David have that level of control over the world. Yeah. And I don't think it's a statement of power. I think it's a statement of experience and knowledge. Yeah. Like, but he David... knows how to control this world. Mm-hmm. And then we have more answers about Lenny. Yeah. We started off with some answers about Lenny, but here we get, I feel like, even more solid. Mm-hmm. We had David asking earlier, like, is there anything about the hospital in you? And here we have the answer. Yes. Yeah. Like, this Lenny is hospital Lenny. And we had um, Valen on Twitter, at Villaramaups. <laughs> uh, mouse. <laughs> Maybe it's mouse P. Mouse P. <laughs> but there's no E after the S. Oh, okay. Uh, asks, like, is this actual hospital Lenny that, that Farouk snatched up her mind when she died? And I think, yeah, yeah that's I exactly so. what it is. Yeah. David says when he's talking to Clark that the Shadow King collects minds. Mm-hmm. And I think, like, how? I don't know. But the Shadow King has captured Lenny's mind hospital Lenny's mind is trapped in the shadow King's essence or whatever. And that is her. Yeah. And this leads like, like to the very first scene of this season, which is like Oliver and Lenny are trapped inside the shadow King who is trapped inside Oliver's body. Yep. And that's like the actual Lenny. Yeah. And we also see that Lenny was like, consciously complicit in messing with David last season. Mm-hmm. Sometimes Farouk was controlling her, but sometimes she was, like, working with him. Mm-hmm. Which gives us a real, makes a lot of sense to how she's interacted with him in the first half of the season. When she remembered stuff that, like, she talked to him like Hospital Lenny. Yeah. And yet not. Yeah. It just really jives with what we saw, I think. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And then Farouk keeps asking Lenny what happens next. Yeah. I love that. that, Like, she's, well, I would would guess I would want to live in my body, and then what happens? Well, I guess I die, and then what happens? And what's the answer? There is no answer. Like, Yeah. Might, like, she, she cannot comprehend that, but that's what he's saying. Yeah. Like what I'm asking when I say what's the answer is, what is Farouk's point? Hmm. What is he trying, what point is he trying to make to Lenny by asking that? That she can live forever inside of him? Yeah, I think so. That's what right? I think. He's driving her to the conclusion of getting my body back is not something I want is not something that has value to me Mm -hmm. because I'll live for a while and then die and then nothing. Mm -hmm. Unless 
like and then what happens after you die is that a is the threat of that nothing you will cease to exist or is the threat of that uh you'll be back with me Hmm. Is that more Possibly. a more immediate and tangible threat? Yeah. I don't know. Yep. So back in the lab, the Carries finally manage to separate by singing a song from their childhood. <laughs> but they can't remerge, and female Carrie is very upset, and she's got a white streak in her hair. <laughs> in Melanie's room, Melanie tells David about Oliver and the founding of Summerland. But David is distracted thinking about Farouk's words. Melanie says she was wrong about the abilities being a gift and tells David just to run off with Sid. On the roof of Division 3, David talks to Sid, who is a cat again. He tells her about her the future her in the orb, and she agrees to help find the monk. In the middle of the chattering people, the monk is awake and he's not chattering. Cut to credits. Cut to credits. How adorable are Carrie and Carrie singing the Tralala song? Yeah, it's super sweet and cute. Agreed. I'm going to have thoughts about the Tralala song at the end when we talk about the music. Mm -hmm. But I think this is a really sweet scene. I really like the way that uh, the show is representing the... Physical, but mostly emotional trauma of the, their roles being switched. Yeah. That Carrie doesn't want to have to live in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Carrie is like, it wasn't our choice in the first place. Like, I really, I just really like this scene. Absolutely. A lot. I also like the way that, um, there's a real... I like how physically uncomfortable she is having him being on the outside and having him inside her. Like he mm-hmm. he is so used to her being inside. He doesn't seem he at all physically uncomfortable uh, up till now. Yeah. And she's like really uh, the performance. She's really showing on her body that she does not like this feeling. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Her hair having a single streak in it is very reminiscent of Rogue from X-Men. It sure is. That makes her the second character in this show who is reminiscent of Rogue in some way. Yeah, which is interesting. It's not Sid who gets a white streak, it's Carrie. Mm Mm-hmm. What is, like, so that white streak, I mean, to just put it out there, uh, to say out loud what seems to be the reasonable assumption, like, that's a sign that she's getting old, that her body is wearing out. I think so. That she or does. that something changed. She only ages when she's out in the real world, but now her aging is catching up to her or is asymmetrical. Yes. Parts of her are aging parts and parts of her. of her aren't, and she's not aging in the normal way or in her usual way. Yes, I think so too. Uh, yeah. And then we have... What do you think of Melanie, like... Bearing her soul about her vulnerabilities in her life, and David is just not listening at all. Yeah, I know, right? Right. It's her I didn't have a dream speech. Yeah. (laughs) Oh. This is like more. This is Melanie being more vulnerable than we've ever seen her. Really? Yes, and continuing to be more jaded than we've ever seen her. She just has no hope. Yeah. All her hope is just completely gone. And, yeah. She says, the world would be just fine. It's always fine. Like, that's jaded. That's a a, uh, sentiment we see come up in superhero shows fairly often. Mm -hmm. Come, you have to be the one that saves the world. Someone else will. It'll all be fine. You don't have to do it. There's no personal responsibility. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't really make any logical sense <laughs> because the fact the world has always been fine before does not mean it will be this time. Yeah. Uh, that's just logic. But it's really a feeling of, you know, it's not your responsibility. You don't have to do anything. Yeah. Uh, you're only responsible for yourself. 
there's a real... It makes a lot of emotional sense coming from her. Yeah, absolutely. Of course that's how she's feeling now. That makes so much sense at this point in her life. She has tried to help, and it has not gone well for her. Yeah. And she says, we all die eventually. And that's exactly like Farouk talking to Lenny. Yeah. He's like, what's going to happen after you live? You're just going to die. And she says, what if you don't help? Some people will die. We all die eventually. Mm -hmm. Like they're really making the same point for the same purpose or different purposes. Like Farouk is trying to convince Lenny to surrender to him. Uh, she's, he's trying to convince her to fear death and surrender to him to avoid death. Yeah. And Melanie is trying to convince David not to fear death because it's inevitable anyway. And so trying to avoid something that's going to happen anyway is futile. Mm -hmm. Like they're making kind of the same point, but from very opposite perspectives. Yeah, Absolutely. When, when I first heard her line of uh, the d real tragedy is forgetting to live, I kind of groaned and was like, oh, that's a bad line. But coming out of Melanie's mouth, Melanie talks in cliches. Hmm. She talks like this. She she's, does. She's hopeless, but she's also just like, she's so had these like cliched ideas for so long that she can't help but speak in cliches. Hmm. Yeah. I still think I like this scene better without that line. Mm -hmm. I think her punchline yeah. being, we all die eventually, or everybody dies. So some people will die, we all die eventually. Yeah. I think that's a better punchline to this scene, this yeah. speech of hers. I agree. But, uh... So there's a shot here of before David goes up, or as David's going up onto the roof of the fan spinning, mm -hmm. and yet it's another swirling motion. It's another vortex. Another vortex, yeah, exactly. Like we started the whole episode on. Hmm. And then there's these hand arrows in the sky. Yeah, what is up with these? Seem to be balloons? I think so. I think they're floating there. Yeah. But they're not just on, like, the Division 3 building. They're, like, far away, too. Unless the Division 3 compound is many buildings. Yes, which it very much might be. Right. Kind of what we've seen seems to indicate that. You're right. But that was my thought, too. Like, they're over the whole city. Yeah. And, and even if they are just Division 3, like, what are they yeah, pointing exactly. to? Exactly. They seem to be, like, pointing to each other. Yeah. And does that mean, I mean... My only thought in terms of arrows pointing to each other is that's a maze. Yeah. Good call. So we start, start this season imagining a maze. If we saw the Division 3 compound from the air and we saw those fingers pointing to each other, we would see a maze, right? Right. That's my only thought. Yeah, it's just a really weird set design thing. Yeah. And I really am very curious about whether that's going to be something that bears fruit or whether it's just going to be an aspect of weirdness. Mm -hmm. And speaking of aspects of weirdness, Sid is eating a dead bird. Ew, she's not actually eating it. She's just playing with it. Yeah. But still gross. Because just even when she, when she gets back to her body, she's still going to have feathers in her mouth. <laughs> is she though? Maybe not. I'm not sure. I'm still not sure how her powers work exactly. Because mm -hmm. when she... We really see again here when she gets back to her body. They switch places. They switch places. Yeah, we see that very clearly again. Ah, uh, so Sid is the cat is hilarious and great. Mm -hmm. But Sid playing with a dead cat, Sid playing with a dead bird, is very unsettling and upsetting. Yeah, exactly. Um, I love. In this scene, David telling his secrets. I love this show for David telling secrets and they don't rely on false conflict. Yes, exactly. Like, the lazier way of doing this is this whole season is about David trying to hide from Sid what he knows. But no, just say it. Mm -hmm. Tell the... Everybody learns 
everybody else's secrets and we deal with the actual facts. Yeah. Instead of people hiding things for no good reason. Yeah. I love it. It's so refreshing. It is, exactly. Yeah. There's enough confusion and secrecy in this show. Uh, they don't have to, and it's so great that they don't rely on people like lying to each other for no reason. Yeah. And Sid brings up the music box again. Yeah. And says, like, I didn't like that. If this is, like, someone we want to work with, is he going to be doing things like this to me? And David says, you didn't ask me to like him just yeah. to work with him. Yeah. And basically, she's saying, like, is he going to play at my vulnerabilities because he knows them? Are you going to play at my vulnerabilities because you know them? Being in a relationship with a mind reader is terrifying. <laughs> Yeah, good point. And she's been more trusting of him than anyone else yeah. throughout. But she here reveals, like, was that you? Did you do that? She mm -hmm. is not, her trust in him is not absolute. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> 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 Didn't even do that on purpose. But that said, I also really like in this scene how she's like, okay, yeah, let's do it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Her okay is exactly the same delivery as, do you want to be my girlfriend? Okay. Yeah. Sid definitely jumps in with both feet and yeah. that gets her into trouble sometimes. I like it as a consistent character trait. I think it is great. Mm -hmm. And I love when a character is consistent. I love when a character is internally coherent. Mm hmm. Uh, and. Like, it makes sense. Well, if I told you to do it, don't you trust me? I trust me. Okay, let's do it. Right? She trusts him. Therefore, she trusts, expects him to trust her. Therefore, she trusts herself, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really good. Yeah. She says that, rea that David has said reality is a choice. But we've never seen him say that. That's been in, like, the narration -y parts. Yeah, when did he say that? Not yeah. in this episode. I don't think so. I watched it three times, and he doesn't say that in this episode. Did he say it in the Other previous episode? Do. I don't, think, I don't, so. don't think so. No. Maybe he does. I so didn't rewatch after this. Does that mean that, that Sid has some secrets that she's keeping from him? Or do they sometimes have conversations that aren't on camera? That is also very possible. But again, like, the question of what is reality, uh, is reality a choice, though? Reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away, suggests that reality is not a choice. Yeah. That you can't just choose to be not in reality. Yeah. And reality depends on, we agree on what's real, so reality depends on uh, consensus also suggests that reality may be a choice, but it's not your choice. Yes, absolutely. Right? But if they can decide together, this brings back the compass, and if we get lost, we get lost together, Like, which brings back the theme throughout the whole two episodes of madness of crowds and delusion as contagion. Yeah. Like, if everyone's mad together, are they now sane? Yeah, exactly. Right? Because if madness means diverging from what everyone else thinks, then contagious madness is the same thing as sanity. Isn't it? Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. You just blew my mind, and I love it. <laughs> contagious madness is the same thing as sanity. And the last question I have... My last, like, thought about this scene is just, is the monk literally physically there in the chattery? I don't know. He's got some, like, blood bags, like an IV pole next to him with, like, yeah. blue liquid in it. I thought that at first, but I, they all do. They and all I, do? Yeah. Oh, all okay. the chattery people have... I did not notice that. Uh, IVs, IVs. And I okay. think that that IV is not his. It's just next to him. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I thought that too at first, but I they think... They all have those. They do. Okay. Well, yeah, in that case, I don't know if the monk is actually there. Just because 
he if he is there, he just arrived. Right. He hasn't been there all along because Oliver would have, like, how could Oliver not have found him? Yeah. Unless he can do some kind of shielding with his brain against He was in the nightclub and David didn't see him. Or almost saw him. Yeah. And if the, if Oliver Farouk has been looking for him and he was in the nightclub with them. Then he wasn't actually there. Then he wasn't actually there and or he can do some kind of screening of shielding of himself. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm looking forward to meeting this monk. Me too. And finding out what is the deal with him. So stories told in this episode, uh, not many. Mm-hmm. want to draw attention to how much Melanie doesn't tell stories. She doesn't tell the story of Miser Sunday, for example. Mm-hmm. She conspicuously doesn't. Melanie tells the story of the founding of Summerland and we don't listen to her. And we've, kind of, we've heard it before. Yeah. And the other real story told in this episode is imagine a boy who's been taught that red is green. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is about the nature of reality, right? Mm-hmm. That doesn't isn't a story that I think requires all that much unpacking. No, at not this really. point because we like kind we of, already have. Yeah. The music in this episode, both the music box and the song sung by Oliver and Lenny as they're killing people in Division Three is the same song. It's "Swinging on a Star" by Frank Sinatra. Uh, and it's. The lyrics go, would you like to swing on a star, carry moonbeams home in a jar, and be better off than you are, or would you rather be a mule? A mule is an animal with long, funny ears, if you'd blah, blah, blah. Or would you rather be a pig? A pig is an animal with dirt on its face, if you don't care, you may grow up to be a pig. Or would you rather be a fish? Uh, And then, we don't hear the words in this episode, but... Uh, it ends with, so you see, it's all up to you. You can be better than you are. You could be swinging on a star. Now, this is a song about two different things that I think are both really thematically significant. And one is you could be better than you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is about um, how you're responsible, how you are responsible for what you do and your effect on the world and your actions and uh, this is a repudiation of Melanie's the world doesn't depend on you because it's you could be who you want to be. You can do things. Uh, and it also connected to why is this music box upsetting to Sid? Maybe I'm way grasping at straws here, but the song is about how you have to be take responsibility for yourself. And if this is what she heard from her mom that like, if you if bad things are happening to you, they're your own fault. Hmm. Is kind of a subtext of this song. Yeah, you. It's up to you who you are. And then there's also who you are is up to you. Really relates to that theme of uh, reality is what you make of it. If you want to be a pig, if you make yourself a pig, you will be a pig. Mm-hmm. Would you like to swing on a star? Then you can. It's all up to you. Reality is a choice. You will be who you want to be, mm-hmm. is the message of this that song. That is the message of that song. The other music in this episode is Carrie and Carrie sing Tra-la-la. Tra-la-la. Tra-la-la-la. Tra-la-la-la-la-la-la. I started too low. <laughs> uh, that is the theme song for a TV show, a children's show that aired in from 1968 to 1970 called The Banana Split. The title of the song is the Tra-La-La song. Uh, it has no words except Tra-La-La. The Banana Splits was a psychedelic show. Uh, and Split is kind of... So it's song they used to Split. Exactly. The song they use to Split is a song from the Split that has the word Split in it. Um, and also we have shots of like Carrie and Carrie as children and then Carrie as an adult and Carrie as a child watching the TV and we don't see what's on it. Mm-hmm. But it's a kid's show song because it, what makes them split is a song that emotionally connects them presumably to an emotional memory of their childhood Yeah, uh, when they were separate. And then also it's just... Uh, 
a important show in the history of psychedelic art. Hmm. Uh, it's the creator, like the creators of the banana split, the, their next show was uh, uh, Puff and Stuff, whatever that is, HR Puff and Stuff, which is another psychedelic kids show hmm. that like these uh, outlandish and bizarre and surreal and psychedelic kid shows that are an inspiration for the kind of thing that Legion is. This is like, this show is like these psychedelic kid shows, but grown up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's significant, I think. Any other songs? That's all for songs. There's one more bit of feedback we got that I wanted to respond to as our ending for this show. Mm-hmm. That is Rachel at Bueno Bueno wonders what Sid the cat's what is Sid's cat's name? Hmm. She asks, uh, it'll either be called Sid or maybe be named Emily. Uh, I wouldn't get the Emily reference. My guess, I don't know, but Sid Barrett is the name of the lead singer of, the original lead singer of Pink Floyd. Right. And there's a Pink Floyd song called Emily Plays. So, Got uh, Sid Barrett wrote a song about Emily. So maybe there's a cat named Emily. Right. If that's not, Rachel, what you were uh, referring to, let us know what it was, because that's my guess. If it's not that, I don't get it either. So I want to end this episode with, what would you name the cat? Uh, you got to go with the obvious here. The cat's name is Kitty Pride. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, Shadow Cat. Or Shadow Cat. <laughs> uh, I thought maybe Schrodinger. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a possible cat. Or this is a uh, reference that has nothing to do with Legion, but uh, a reference to the musical Waitress. To call it Sardine, because it really is hilarious to name a cat a kind of fish. <laughs> <laughs> I think the cat could be called Rachel Keller, just to like mess with your brain. Oh, that's my favorite <laughs> suggestion ever. <laughs> I'm going, I'm, I'm calling it in la- Intel... The show gives the cat a name. We should call the cat Rachel Keller. All right. Okay. <laughs> if you have any cat name suggestions or any other things you want to talk about about Legion, you can uh, get at us on Twitter, at ClockworksCast. Send us an email with your longer thoughts all about Legion. Tell us what we, tell us what, what we missed, what we forgot to talk about, or whatever you've noticed. ClockworksCast at gmail.com. You could also hit us up. We're on Facebook, Reddit, Patreon, patreon.com slash clockworkscast. We're all over the internet. All of those links are in our show notes. If you click on your little podcast reader, you'll, you can see them there. Mm-hmm. I've been Paul Moffat. I've been Jan Moffat. Goodbye.